Welcome to Bethlehem of Calusa, Calusa, California. The sun has been shining for a couple of days. We've gotten a lot of great rain and great snow. And pray that God will let it down slowly so we are not flooded. Today we are celebrating the fourth Sunday of the season of Lent. We've been following Jesus along and seeing all of the very important things that happened in his life that point him to be exactly who he was, that very Son of God, the light of the world. And today, it's very close to the end for him. He's going down to the temple to celebrate the tabernacles of booths, living out in the wilderness, remembering all that they have gone through as a chosen people of God in the wilderness. But he goes very, very carefully, we will see as we discuss this, <clears throat> because he has so many different things yet he has to still do. He has to make it absolutely clear of who he is so that the leaders of the temple have no excuse when they put him to death. And it has to be on a certain season a certain celebration that has to be on Passover. So we watch carefully as Jesus performs another miracle. And oh, by the way, yes, he gets in trouble again. We join together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The introit David recalls the comfort of being in God's temple. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of, the, out of the net. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, <clears throat> for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent, he will lift me high upon a rock, and all my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices and shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will ever be. Amen. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness Give thanks for all your benefits and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. <clears throat> for God here foretells what he will do through his Messiah Jesus as a sign that he has come among his people. For a long time I have held my peace, I have kept silent and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor, I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see, who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send, who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord. He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteous sake 
to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the epistle lesson is recorded for us in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Paul writes, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stand now, if you are able, in honor of Christ, of whom the gospel speaks. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. <clears throat> As Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or, or his parents that he has been born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went washed and came back seeing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. <clears throat> now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and, and I wash and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We join together now in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace and mercy and peace be unto you, God our Father, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. We focus in on two verses. <clears throat> As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And then verse 39. <clears throat> Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. My dear Christian friends, we're going to take a journey, journey to where Jesus lived when he was upon this earth. It's the season of October. The tabernacle celebration is in place. The harvest feast, a time to remember all that they had gone through as they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, all that God had miraculously provided for them, manna and quail. But one thing that is of interest right now is that Jesus is not here. And, and we know that Jesus is supposed to fulfill everything and all of the celebrations and everything in the, in the law for us, but, but he's not here, and why is that? Scripture has revealed to us earlier that the disciples are already there in Jerusalem. So we take a quick little journey. We find ourselves in Capernaum, the hometown of Jesus. We found that Jesus plans to travel to the feast secretly. And that's a good reason for this, because the Jews in Jerusalem, they're trying to kill him. And we watch as Jesus rolls up his bed pack and, and packs his lunch for his journey. He knows what he's doing. He knows why he has to go, what he's going to do when he gets there, how it's going to interact with the temple leaders. There's a sadness in his eyes. And we follow along just a little bit behind him, watching him walking along, unnoticed by others. So many have already left. We go east from Capernaum. We cross the Jordan River. It's very narrow and shallow there. It's a 60 plus mile journey, and we're beginning right now in the garden spot of Israel. The fields are still a bit green around the edges, and the, the waving grain that was there with the wind blowing it back and forth has now been harvested. It's, it's all tied up in bundles and circles waiting for to dry out so that the seed can be harvested. It's going to be a three day journey. But now, as we get closer and closer down to the the south, the road has turned dusty. No longer do we see the verdant fields and apple orchards. What do we see, though? We see crowds of people by the thousands. They're heading uphill to Jerusalem. What a battle it is for them. But they focus on that hill. They focus on what they're going to see there. And they know that they're not going to be able to sleep well because they're going to be outside. They're going to a place where the light source of salvation is soon to be snuffed out. But these people have no idea whom is going to do it, how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. And they just don't see it as part of their own future. So on they go to Jerusalem. For them, it's a duty. It's a requirement of the law. And so up to the city, standing proud on Mount Zion, the sun is beginning to set as we make camp for the night. It's been a dusty four-day journey. Normally, Jesus would go to the eastern side of the Brook Kidron, and that's the place near the Garden of Gethsemane where all of those from Galilee would be, but he's hiding. All of his disciples, his mother, his brothers, his sisters, have camped there in their own leafy tabernacles. But tonight is different. Jesus hides himself. Morning comes too early. We are weary from our journey. And we continue to follow Jesus, though, even <clears throat> though we want to not be noticed as we stay back just a bit. As far as though, as we can see, this Jesus has asked. He's been asked by the Father to do something that is so risky. He's risking his life to come here today. And and we really don't understand why that could be so important. 
then we look at Jesus and we see that he is bending down and talking to a beggar at the temple steps. And as we move in closer, we can hear the disciples asking, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents that he was born blind? They too think, obviously, some sin has caused this problem. Just look at him. The teachers of law say children can be born in sin, already sinners. <clears throat> and sure, yes, we are all sinners. We have sin in, our, in ourselves. Uh, we have We have an attitude of sin. It is our nature to be that. And yet, as we look at this, this man, this man born blind from, from birth, what could he have done that shows up so strongly? What does Jesus say? <clears throat> he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now I want you to think about that just a moment because there might be some things that happen in your life personally and you wonder why it's happened to you. But when you look back, you can say, God did show a miracle in my life. Verse 4, as long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. And notice that it's a we there. <clears throat> Jesus is including his disciples in this work that must be done. And today we are also his disciples, and we have this work that must be done. Night is coming when no one can work, Jesus said. When I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. What does he mean that God's work might be displayed? And we wonder and we watch intently. And Jesus squats down takes some spittle and he makes some mud and he puts it on the man's eyes. You can almost see him doing this. You can almost even imagine that he was thinking to himself, <clears throat> I remember when I did this with Adam, with Adam and I made his eyes for him. <clears throat> and then Jesus tells the man, go wash in the pool of Siloam. That word Siloam there means the one that is sent. So he sent them to the sent pool. We follow the blind man as he, he's going down towards the pool and some people are trying to help him, kind of pulling him along and quickly stumbling and almost falling. Finally, he reaches out and he sticks his foot down into the, the field of water and carefully then lowers himself into that pool of Siloam and bending down and now scooping up water and washing the mud off of his eyes. And suddenly we can see that he can see. He climbs out of the pool, and now he's running. No longer does he have to touch along the, wall, along the walls to find his way. Step by step, he counts his way back. He knows just how many steps to take to get home to where he belongs. Intently, he looks and, and sees all the sights and ties it in with the sounds of his journey. And then when he turns a corner to his home, he rushes inside. <clears throat> And we can hear him say, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they ask him. I don't know. Just then we see someone from the family running to tell the temple priest what a day this has been. Anyone who cannot see that this is the very son of God must be indeed spiritually blind. And then look, we look and we see that the temple guards have come for the man. This, this could mean trouble. The fellow arriving at the temple is indeed in trouble. The Pharisees ask him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he has not kept the Sabbath. So strict were the laws that they followed. But others ask, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. <clears throat> Finally, they turn again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. You could hear a pin drop as the chief priest stepped back in wonderment. As we watch the scene, we know that if he is a prophet, 
A prophet is someone who speaks words from God, and suddenly his parents are brought in. Is this your son, they ask? Is this the one that you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? Listen to what his parents say. We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how can he see now, or op who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. Very interesting thing here, because yes, he is of age. He is personally responsible for himself. Why are the parents treating him this way? <clears throat> well, the text tells us. Verse 22. <clears throat> the parents say this because they are afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ would be put out of the synagogue, kicked out of the church. No more access to the temple no more sacrifices, totally cast out. As we review the scene, we think perhaps sometimes when we were asked something about a certain thing that might imply that you did something right or wrong, <clears throat> and you skirt around the issue. That's what the parents were doing. And then we can see, we see the high priest motion with his hands and sends off the guards. And a second time they summon the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. <clears throat> he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? They're looking for strong evidence of work here. Listen to what the young man says. I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And we watch the young man, head hanging low, makes his way out through the temple doors, across the courtyard, down the long, steep steps. He seems to be very disappointed just when he can see the beautiful temple, the gold and the ivory. He gets kicked out. We follow along as the young man, dejected, begins to wander down the narrow streets of Jerusalem, putting together the sound of the streets and with the images, images only imagined before what a gift. Yet there is a sadness because of someone else's spiritual blindness. Verse 35. Jesus hears that they have thrown him out. And when he finds them, he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus says, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he fell down and worshipped him. I want you just to think about this for a moment as we've been going through this over the past few Sundays. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration tells his disciples not to reveal who he is. In last Sunday's Gospel, Jesus revealed that he is the Messiah, and this to a woman, a known sinner, a Samaritan, one who was cast out of her own society because of her sin, and now he reveals who he is to a man who was born blind, another outcast, a beggar. And the paradox is this, though this man can now see, he has just been cast out of his society, not because of his sin, but think of this, so that God could reveal Messiah Jesus to him and more. God works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. All this at the very steps of the temple so that those who were in darkness could step into the light so that those who were subjected to spiritual blindness could receive spiritual light and see a great light but at this moment darkness surrounds this scene and the rejected and compassionate christ who came down from heaven to seek and to save the lost 
He's in his company with his own kind of people, people who are rejected. What a sadness in his voice. Jesus says, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And we think back and recall that scripture foretold those of his own people will reject him. It's as if Jesus has said, now that you have seen this miracle, and it has not moved your heart to fall down and worship Jesus Messiah, as this man has, you indeed are blind. And as we think again of all that we have heard and seen with, with our mind's eye, we ask the man of today's text who was born blind, was it his fault or his parents? And we would say no. Were the Pharisees blind? Yes, spiritually blind because of their ancestry. They had been taught to be blind concerning the Christ. And the older they got, the blinder they became. Are we blind? Well, no, yes, and no. Well, first, no. Most of us are not physically blind, though we may have some issues with our eyesight as we get older. And the youth and the children around us, they, they really don't appreciate what they have. And most of us can look around and we can see the beauty of nature, but to answer part two of the question, are we humans blind? And we would say yes. Yes, in a way. For as we look around and see spiritual blindness and the darkness of unbelief, yes, all of us, the Bible clearly states, we're born spiritually blind. And perhaps some of you were kept in blindness until you left home. And you were on your own, and then finally, by God's grace, you... Through his holy word, you were able to see more clearly. Others, by the grace of God and good parents and grandparents, were brought out of darkness at a very young age. You were baptized into the family of God. You received his Holy Spirit that you might become faithful and grow in faith. And so to answer part two and part three, are we blind? We would now say no. For the Holy Spirit has enlightened us. God's holy word has shown into us by amazing grace, the grace of God. He anoints our spiritual eyes that we can see and we can worship the healer. What a privilege to share this amazing grace. And so won't you too share this grace with somebody else, someone who is in darkness? Share the light, share the light so others too can say with the Man born blind, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. And the people of God say, Amen. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For the church of God, that she, enlightened by the gospel, would be a home for those cast out of this world. For all who seek refuge in the church of Christ, that God would raise up pastors in every age to serve them in his name. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For those baptized into the light of Christ, that he would guide us in his ways and teach us to both learn and to know and to do his will. For those who wander in the darkness through rough places in this life, that they would wait on the salvation of the Lord and not be put to shame. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all of those afflicted by body or soul, especially you folks out there and people that you know, that they would take heart and trust in Christ for healing and find him even in the midst of their trials. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen and amen. Lord, is this a with your blessing? Fill our hearts with joy and peace. Let us each your love possessing, triumph in redeeming grace. Oh, refresh us, oh, refresh us, traveling through this wilderness. Thanks we give an adoration for your gospel's joyful sound. May the fruits of your salvation in our hearts and minds abound. Ever faithful, ever faithful, who your truth may we be found. Savior, when your love shall call us from our struggling pilgrim way, let not fear of death fall us, let your summons to obey. May God continue to fill you with grace and hope as you see and find in this season of Lent as we have been traveling down the path behind Jesus, following and seeing all that he has done and knowing for sure in our own lives and our own hearts that Jesus Christ truly was and still is the Son of the living God. Put your trust in him, never give up on Jesus, and he will never give up on you. Amen.